This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Stick around to find out how you can get 84% off and four extra months for free. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and what a jam-packed episode we have for you this week. We catch up with the latest Starship developments, including another successful static fire test before the imminent 15km test flight of Starship Serial Number 8. That could be just days away now. We have some absolutely amazing footage here from Rocket Lab from their recent launch and first booster recovery. Also, two launches of the Falcon 9 this week, one of which was from the West Coast with the launch of the Sentinel. 6 ocean mapping satellite, as well as the other from the east coast which was another batch of 60 Starlink satellites. On top of all that, we have a quick catch up with the Perseverance rover as it traverses space on its way to Mars, and China launched its groundbreaking moon sample retrieval mission. Over to Starship news for the week, we have recent scheduled road closures that are indicating that SN8's historic 15km test flight could happen during the week beginning Monday the 30th of November, with Monday's test window ranging from 7am to 6pm local time. As Elon has previously noted on Twitter, SpaceX intends to live stream the event, so keep an eye out there. Also scheduled this week was a static fire for SN8. After Monday's unknown cancellation of testing, SpaceX SpaceX utilised the backup window on the 24th of November, successfully firing all three Raptor engines. This test utilised Raptor SN30, SN36 and SN42, and it's expected to be the final major test ahead of the highly ambitious 15km flight. That will have the controlled belly flop return and potential landing back at the pad. Now, During that testing window, propellant load began at 5.01pm, with engine chill starting a couple of minutes later, denoting by those three triangular vents on the side of the vehicle. We then saw frost forming and venting at the tip of the nose cone, indicating that the oxygen header tank was also filled and pressurised. Then at 5.23pm, SpaceX successfully ignited what seemed to be all three Raptor engines for a duration of around three seconds. Now, it is unknown whether the static fire drew its propellant from the main tanks or the header tanks, all of which were filled and pressurised. Elon Musk commented on this test by tweeting that it was a good Starship SN8 static fire, and therefore the path is now cleared for SN8 to conduct a test flight to 15 kilometers as soon as November 30 next week. He then added that the goals for this flight are to test the three engine ascent, the body flaps, the transition from main to header tanks, as well as the landing flip. Now all of these stages have never been tested at this scale at all, and therefore the chance of a rapid unscheduled disassembly is highly likely. Elon said there is a one in three chance of SN8 landing successfully after the flight. If things go wrong, that's why they have SN9 and SN10 as backups. Elon also confirmed that the 15km test flight will be using the main tanks only slightly filled. It is still presumed, however, that the header tanks will be required for the flip maneuver and landing burn. Anthony here on Twitter also asked if he has any updates regarding the new versions of the legs for Starship, to which he replied that this is a subject of much debate. Now, this was a pretty cryptic kind of answer, and there was no follow-up on what was meant by this either. Let me know what you think in the comments. Remember that back in August, Elon mentioned that the version 2 legs will be much wider and taller like Falcon, but capable of landing on unimproved surfaces and auto-leveling. I suspect there is a lot of debate going on about how this would be implemented with the Starship design, especially around the windward side where the heat shield is going to be. I would think that legs that sit out from the body would be a real struggle to design with that re-entry in mind. This has been a big week at the construction site as well, and as we fly ourselves all the way over, this gives you just a bit of an idea of the real distance between the two sites. Just for fun, a few super heavy booster prototypes there just to illustrate scale. Just take a look at those monsters. So yes, SN9's nose cone has been mated with the five ring high barrel section early this week after it received its forward flaps last week, completing SN9's fairing section. Now this completed nose cone section was then rolled from the low bay and into the high bay. Unlike SN8, SN9 was being prepared for full stack assembly inside, which we also saw occur by midweek. This process should be making the stacking much easier for the workers. We've actually seen scaffolding added to the top of SN9's tank section 
sections, which provides the team with a more stable platform to stand on when the final sections are welded together. So yes, SpaceX now has two fully complete and full scale Starship vehicles in their fleet. What a huge accomplishment this is. Now just to compare some of these builds, Viv on Twitter asked Elon what the minor differences are between SN8, SN9 and SN10. Elon replied saying that there are many small improvements but overall they are very similar. In the newer versions the wiring is more robust, the engines more mature and the nose cone is sealed better. He also added that there are major upgrades slated for SN15. Could it perhaps be possible that SN15 could be the first uncrewed orbital Starship prototype? Mary aka Boca Chica Gal with the NASA spaceflight team along with RGV aerial photography have been pumping out these amazing views all week. Make sure you're getting all this material direct from the source in the description because we get so many insights from all of this. Spotted early in the week was the methane header tank for SN13. This is the very first piece of SN13 to be identified on site. A common dome was also moved out of one of the tents and was then sleeved soon after, presumably also for SN13. Now here's the latest Starship and Super Heavy status diagrams that we have thanks to Brendan. The prototype fleet is really expanding to an exponential rate now. From now on, Brendan's diagrams will include iconography below each prototype with the snowflake representing a cryogenic liquid nitrogen test and the flames there indicating a static fire. Hopefully soon, Brendan can add a flight icon to SN8. Let me know in the comments below what suggestions and ideas you may have to help Brendan continue to improve these weekly diagrams. Thank you all so much for your support of all of the various channels, especially this one right here of course. Every like, comment and subscription helps us to grow the channel and that goal of hitting 250,000 subscribers by January is all because of you right there. Thank you very much. Now Raptor SN44 was delivered Saturday morning along with the appearance of two Merlin 1D engines. This is now one of the two available Raptors that we see in stock at the construction site at Boca Chica, SN46 being the other one. Are these Raptors going to be installed on SN9? We'll have to wait and see. The Merlin engines were not unloaded from the delivery truck of course, but it's interesting to see them here. If you have any ideas on what they might be used for, let me know in the comments below. Interestingly, SN44 was also sporting a fancy hand turkey. So happy slightly belated Thanksgiving to all of you American viewers. At the orbital launch pad, workers have been seen erecting walls for what seems to be a new bunker, quite similar to the one that was built at the suborbital pad a couple of months ago. Toby here mentioned how nuts it is that the future Super Heavy boosters will land right on top of the launch mount. Elon corrected him by saying actually it will land off to one side so it doesn't take out the launch mount in a bad landing. He added that the same arm used to pick up the Starship will also be used to place the booster back on the mount. Now this may contradict his statement from two weeks ago where he said that SpaceX were still pursuing the idea of landing the booster so precisely that it doesn't need landing legs at all. This may mean that early flights will land on the pad next to the launch mount with the aspirational goal in the future of landing back on the launch mount itself. After our dedicated video about orbital refilling midweek, Elon Musk commented on that work reiterating that four essential elements are needed to make this dream of multi-planetary life a reality. Rapid and complete rocket reuse, low cost propellant, orbital refilling and propellant production at the destination. He also showed some interest in a Starship tanker design that would be completely full of fuel. This would be much heavier and require extra vacuum engines to accommodate the extra mass. Elon replied on this saying yes, it would definitely need more engines if we were to make the cargo bay all propellant, but it's probably smarter than a whole new shorter external hull. In terms of that propellant production, it's not the priority right now, but Elon hinted that perhaps a year from now could see the start of this in situ resource utilization experimentation. It all depends on how much Starship progress is made before that time. November 21st was the launch date for the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission. This launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base from Slick 4E. Arriving from Germany in late September 2020, Sentinel-6 was unpacked, prepared for launch and finally integrated with Falcon 9 before being rolled out to the launch pad the day prior to launch. Now Sentinel-6 is a $97 million ocean mapping science satellite weighing 2,628 pounds or 1,192 kilograms. This is designed to measure sea levels right down to a crazy accuracy of within three quarters of an inch or two centimeters thanks to the Poseidon 4 radar altimeter. 
This also uses electromagnetic signals that are beamed to the ocean surface and back for continuous measurements. I've included a link to this video here which goes into more detail about how the returned echo and wavelength shape determines the wave characteristics. The data collected will help with understanding the Earth's changing climate, impact on coastlines such as flooding potential, ship navigation and also being able to assist with weather forecasts. This of course also builds on the current JSON series of satellites that have been gathering data since 2001, with Sentinel-6 having far more capabilities to add to that toolkit. It was great launch weather on the day, with none of the typical fog that can envelop the area as we saw last time with the Radarsat mission. That mission though did have very great audio. This latest liftoff sent the Falcon 9 lofting its payload skyward with some great visuals on the ascent. This was of course a brand new shiny booster for this unique mission. Just beautiful footage as it made its way back to Earth, as well as this fantastic view of the booster touching down at the landing pad. So yes, onward to payload deployment around one hour later, and Sentinel-6 was on its way soon to be gathering that crucial science data. The fairings were also recovered successfully from the splashdown zone, as we see here as they were returned to port. Shortly after all of this news, of course, just days later we had yet another Starlink launch. What was to be a launch from the east coast approximately 10 hours following on from the Sentinel-6 launch on the west coast, Starlink Mission 15 was scrubbed with the launch director calling hold and seeking what was described as additional mission assurance. The next day's launch attempt was also scrubbed due to poor weather in the recovery area. Finally, on Tuesday, November 24th, we saw a nighttime launch attempt under some slightly windy conditions at the pad. We'll talk more about that in in a moment, but before that, a huge thank you to my sponsor Surfshark VPN, who have been a huge supporter of my channel throughout the year. Every video you see here and a lot more have been supported by Surfshark, which has allowed us to increase the time and effort that goes into the channel. That has obviously been hugely beneficial, as those of you that have been subscribed for a while would have seen. Now, a virtual private network or VPN allows you the potential to truly open up the internet. Have you exhausted content to stream from libraries within the country? Well, with Surfshark. VPN, you can easily open up new content to explore from around the world previously restricted from you. Simply change which country you're accessing the internet from and boom, you now appear to be browsing from that location and have access to brand new content to consume. This also allows access to social platforms and external news services that have perhaps been restricted from you. With your IP address, your behavior is tracked for marketing purposes all over the world. The internet should be open and log free and by using Surfshark VPN, you can take control of your your online security and visibility. He can protect yourself from data mining services, internet service providers, or perhaps even from those around you who may have very differing personal views or beliefs. If you would like to support my channel and are also considering a VPN or even changing your existing VPN, go to surfshark.deals Marcus and you will get 84% off and four extra months for free. With the 30 day money back guarantee, there's no risk in trying it out for yourself. The link is in the description below. So yes, to date SpaceX have sent almost 900 Starlink satellites into orbit and we are quickly approaching that 1000 mark now, so much closer to the minimum deployment amount of 1400 satellites for 100% global coverage. There was a little time devoted here to talking about the public beta test program with an example of a cell or coverage area in Minnesota. Mention was also made of a notable expansion of the public beta coming soon in late January into February 2021. So yes, remember to register your interest in being a beta tester on the Starlink website. Here we saw yet another flawless countdown to T-minus zero and Falcon 9 lifting off with another 60 Starlink broadband satellites. This is the first time a booster had flown for a seventh time. Shortly after main engine cutoff and fairing separation, the booster re-entry burn signified the start of another milestone achievement. With some anticipation and the drone ship lit up, we saw the booster stick the landing, making this the first seventh flight and landing with these Falcon 9 boosters. On to payload deploy shortly thereafter and we watched the tension rods release and the next batch of Starlink satellites were on their way. Another terrific mission there by SpaceX. Now some pretty amazing stuff here from Rocket Lab. I just have to share this quick clip from that recent return to sender mission showing the first and second stage separation process before copping a punch to the sensors. Just check this out, the audio in this is incredible. Thank you. 
due to the awesome quality of this footage, we can only assume that cameras were retrieved from the booster itself after that successful recovery. This is really something to be proud of, and well done to the amazing team at Rocket Lab. Just a quick update as Perseverance makes its way to Mars for the February 2021 landing. In a recent article published by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, there was a couple of pretty cool items I wanted to quickly share with you. One was this montage captured during system checks made up of three separate images taken by the HASCAM on the rear left. Then there is some actual audio from inside the protective shell captured by the entry, descent and landing microphone. And what you can hear is a pump which is part of the rover's thermal recirculation system. Pretty awesome stuff, and you can check out the full link to the article from the description. An interesting launch from China this week as well with the awesome Moon Harvest mission that aims to send a lander to the Moon's surface, retrieve samples and return them here to Earth. The mission contains the Lunar Orbiter, the lander and a sample return system. This is something that hasn't really been attempted since the 1970s. If this mission is successful, it'll also make it the first mission for China to return Moon surface samples. That has only been done previously by the United States with the Apollo program and of course the Soviet Union's uncrewed lunar missions. Now one of the objectives is to collect unique samples obtained from the moon which could help scientists understand which volcanoes were last active. That will make for some interesting analysis here on Earth. So yes, the launch itself was on China's Long March 5 rocket as we see here. The mission overall should be lasting around 23 days, so in a few weeks time we'll know if this has been a success or not. The announcement was made shortly after the spacecraft had successfully entered the designated orbit, and this was then followed by the deployment of its solar arrays. So yes, onwards now to the moon for the vessel, and as far as we know, the mission continues to go smoothly. We'll be reporting back when we know more about this ground breaking mission for China. This incredible new space race that we find ourselves in continuously blows my mind. Now this coming Tuesday, the 1st of December, is the very last day that you can sign up for the I Need More Moon project created by fellow YouTuber TJ Cooney of I Need More Space. If you haven't spotted this project yet, you are missing out because he is sending thousands of names on the Peregrine Lunar Lander that will be on board the first launch of United Launch Alliance's Vulcan rocket next year. Even more awesome, he is doing all of this for free, so don't miss your chance, you just need to head over to INeedMoreMoon.com and fill in the form. As far as I understand, the first people registered get names engraved on a piece of silicate, with the remaining names hitching a ride on an SD card. So yes, pretty awesome stuff there. The link to that is in the description below. A big thank you to my incredibly supportive patrons listed right there. Your support has helped me so much in creating more and better content. Each and every one of you makes a huge difference. The midweek video linked in the end screen just would not have been possible without all of you. Thank you each and every one of you. If you would also like to help support so we can continue to create more content, head to patreon.com slash marcushouse. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the included roles on our Discord server. You can also have earlier access to the videos to watch before anyone else, and of course you can also have your names listed right here like all of these other wonderful people. Also huge thanks especially to Brendan, Adam and Brenton assisting greatly with video production. That midweek video is a great example of teamwork there. Of course the entire quality control squad here helps to correct our mistakes, so everyone here is involved in most of what you see. If you are interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, consider maybe getting in touch with me on Twitter or Discord. In the tile in the bottom left today we have my midweek video explaining the new funding provided to SpaceX for refilling prototypes and demonstrations, along with why refilling in orbit will change everything. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.